Where are you going with that, Joe? I'm going to put it outside. Jeremy, Jeremy. Come here, Jeremy. Come here. Just waiting for yeah, you know, a rock to come along and yep. rip it out of your hands. Uh huh. Joe said, "Wait to see the radio." He says, "The outlet on the end that comes out the front, it goes around underneath." See the wide the Taking out toys. Do you need box to lift here, Joe? Yeah, I got, I got something. Anyway, I got a Probably could. Uh, yeah. Oh, good. No, it's hard to get done. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Watch the steering arm on this. Go, side. hang on a minute. You don't want to be looking like that. So you need to go to the back side of the steering arm. Yeah. Okay, the box is up to put on something else. You also want to put it up. I need a piece of block here. Like a power. Well, oh, see, yeah, there's a line up here, but. Can't quite get that to go on. Oh, without crushing the muffler? Without crushing the muffler here. So you gotta be like this, and I need a block right here. Let me grab You got like a 4x6, Joe? A little bit. You got any long 2x6? Two two so, what you're going to do? You fold it? I should sell it, yeah. I can't be real back. Hey, get, so, get, do your forks spread out independently? No. The, and they're, they're out they're as far as they'll go. Out. Go ahead, man. <laughs> Documenting it. Uh, oh, yeah. What if we put a whole for insurance purposes? <laughs> It'd probably be safer, wouldn't it? Is that crazy about it? I wouldn't believe it. So that one... There's got to be a joke here about how many... 
How many Jeep guys it takes? Yeah. You need, you need two little chunks of two by four about this long. Okay. If you do that, then you're going to add a little by four to the other. Oh, but I wouldn't be able to get it out without Joe. Oh, you know what? Right here, yeah. It's just, it's going to spray. It's not really going to be holding it. It's another. Yeah, I'm concerned that the weight is all wrong. It needs to be more further forward. It needs to be on that side. Otherwise, it would be. That doesn't seem sketchy. This will be okay. It's gonna work. Sorry, Bob doesn't, Bob doesn't have any kids. Hey, now, let me get out of here, Joe. Lindsay will still buy it. It's a little freaked me out. Even with Bob on there? <laughs> you know, something bad. Really? You want us to pull those boards out, or are you comfortable with it? Keep it down. It's clear. Whoa, 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 slow down. Your, your pitch back. I just want to make sure somebody's watching the uh, windshield. Uh, the windshield's full of pellets. Oh, uh, we're fine. We're more than clear. It's good. Doing it. Am I, am I clear on the... You're clear. Oh, you're clear. Yeah, you're, you're clear. All the way you're clear. A foot past me at least. Didn't it? I, uh, I'm shocked you don't have a custom rig. I've never, you can't get out of there, can you? Uh, I can do it. We can, hey, Joe, we can drop the forks. No, no, no. No, I can't. Can we just take it? Just, just, they don't drop? Oh. Can we, we take the extensions off? No. No, no. Can I just, do we lift the front? Right? We got enough horsepower. Can't you just roll it over? Well, here's what we're going to do. Let's just, air, let's just air up the tires and just roll it over it. Yeah. Let's, air, air, air. Air. let's get the wood off of there while we're... Yeah, you take all that wood out of there. We're going to air up the tires? Yeah, I can't wait to see this. <laughs> <laughs> Those are may pop, man. <laughs> let's go, good year! <laughs> well, hey, I got faith in this one. <laughs> I agree, the front one's a good year. Yep. Yeah. 
I'm not sure about that. Back I don't think this back one's gonna work. Yeah. It might there. <laughs> you good? Go ahead and move it. Wait, wait, wait. You've got to change it. Isn't that a cool thing? Yeah. Yeah, but push it back so that we can at least put Why did you spray over the rear lights? Why? I don't know what I was thinking. Oh, you painted these? These are reflectors, actually. <clears throat> did you paint this, too? Yeah. No, I didn't do anything to oh. this. No, this is, this is the way I got it. You said push it back. Let's look at the engine. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Isn't, that, isn't that something? Cool. Is that the holy grail of carburetors? Yeah, it is. Do you want the Big Daddy sticker that's in there? <laughs> we could probably get it off with a little effort. No, he no, put that on there. He is the Big Daddy. Big <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do we get this thing, Joe? Uh, oh my gosh. This whole thing. Mowen wasn't enough Look at good this. chick. He had to put a Big Daddy uh, sticker on. Uh, what with the radiator? Uh, Why could they not have switched that to the other side? Oh, no, I, I, I picked it's a radiator they had. <laughs> this is the engineer's uh, prototype, right? These there were 1500 of these made. Oh, there were that so many. So there, there okay. were prototypes before this. Um, what was the Ford Pygmy was before this, and then when they accepted Ford's design for further testing, they built 1500 of these. I don't think the air cleaners works as well as I thought. Here's <laughs> the tape. Catch the it's, it's, it's really a Ford Dyna and tractor motor. That's the choke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. I guess it works. Yeah, these things are wow. These things are rare. This four pin is amazing. Got fifteen hundred, and, and then it's like an FC. And they were probably given away. Uh, well, the military used the military used them. I mean, I saw. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, they're kind of like wow. a, they're kind of like a bucket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you see these, Jonah? In what year? Oh, this is a forty-one. The wood and everything. They only made these in forty-one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, these are snazzy seats. Aren't they? Yeah. I'd like that one. My yep, wife is driving. There's a seat here somewhere. There's there's here. There's 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 is there a count for how many are? There's quite a few around. running around. There's, yeah, there's quite a few out there. There's a there's a guy. I, mean, I wouldn't in, say there's like. There's not a thousand. There's not, not a thousand yeah. of them, but I bet I bet there's. I bet there's uh, 150, 200 of them. Yeah, well, I know the guy three of them are by my The guy's yeah. fine. It's got one. He's got a restored one. Yeah, he has a four wheel steer one, doesn't he? I don't know about that. George Holland has one. There's only like Didn't Lindsay four. Clark have a four-wheel steer one? Lindsay's got one. George Holland's got one. Yeah. And there's two other guys, I can't remember their names, that have one. There's a company mm -hmm. in, or a guy in France that makes body types. In. Why, I don't know. When you start talking about, you know, there might be 800 of them left or 500 of them left. Well, who's the, who's the, uh, who's the guy in Pennsylvania? That's all he does is deals in, in, in phantom... The, the GP part. That's all he deals in. I know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, he makes a living out of it. I mean, the, the parts are crazy. You're crazy not talking about metal shape or you're talking somebody, somebody else over there. Yeah, I can't. I, 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 I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but oh, yeah, I'll, yeah I'll, I mean, that's all he does. But, and he, he, he sources used parts and and does reproductions and stuff too. But a hundred percent done. This thing is worth sixty, seventy thousand dollars. Is it? Aren't they? I don't know. I bet it's worth more than that. <laughs> Might be more than that. GP. So, so some of the Bantams are worth but that. But getting it to that point right, is exactly, yes. crazy, yeah. crazy yeah. expensive. <coughs> yeah, this one had a top on it. Hold on, and then you can't play with it anymore. No. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's, one, a, that's a given. This one had a top on it, too. It's one of the first things they learned. Okay. Yeah, Lindsay had, Lindsay had to fabricate one of these. Can you imagine that?
Oh, the whole thing's jacked up. Nice, huh? Yeah, but you don't see it that nice very often, do you? You know the tailgate, you know, for straightening, but the tailgate isn't all rotted out. Right. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Yeah. I've seen people drill holes right next to the football holes to put shit. I'm like, really? Yep. And I think it's got like a good, maybe it's got a good toolbox lid. Remember. It was the same as a 3B. It was the same as a 3B. Yeah, yeah. I think way, if I were to build a, like a, a 2A, I would want to put a 3A toolbox in it. You know, for, a, for one that I want to drive around all the time. They don't seal any better than 2A. Don't they? Well, they, they have a seal on them, but they don't really need to do that. But the, but, but the water, like in 2A, the water just runs, all of it runs right into the toolbox. Okay, so about half of it all runs into the uh, okay. I'll just put Tupperware in my toolbox. You know, there's shattered trees every day. Uh, I thought this was going to be a good day. Of course, you know, the jingle is going to be freaking backwards. You're a monk of everything. Sure. Can I do that? You got yeah. Sand. All right. You got sand. I'll take a We'll call it a mess. Well, you know what's going to happen? We've got no uh, boat things on. We'll call it a mess. You know, you know, oh, uh, I got to uh, see how far this is sticking out the, uh, porch. Yeah, so I can get it on the rack without hitting the garage door. Yes, I'm going to make I that. I forgot there was a garage door there. Yeah. Can you uh, set it down and we can back it? I can it? set it down. Watch that room. Watch that room. Watch that room. Pull it back a little yeah. bit. And then probably be safer. Unless one of you guys want to take this home. 
650 bucks. Come on, Jonah. I got, I got enough. <laughs> it's a nice little project. <laughs> I got to clear that. Yeah. Mm hmm. It goes right to the point. It's like a flying jeep. Six inches. There you go. That, I think that'll work. Yeah, you're no, I should have saved that stuff. So the wheels. So the wheels when I had the track mobile both onto this, the wheels are like um, that, that big around. Right, right, right. I'm gonna have to pull. I gotta pull back up. Your, your front tire is lower. Than Side ship. Side ship. Side ship. Side ship. 
I don't think the wheelbase is the same. Yeah, it is. Really? Yeah, no, 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 80 inches was, that was the standard for their prototyping. But I want this G. Yeah, that is no gear away. Drop. Did you get it? <laughs> yeah, I want them right. Yeah. Oh, square. Yeah. Uh, shake that zone, baby. How are we front and rear? I bet Joe will go through this. I think it's alright. You know, a lot of times we start with a bear shot. Everybody knows. Yeah. 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 Going all the way up, right? Eventually. Right here. And it runs a great rod back to here. And then right there mounts a box. Okay. And it mounts inward yep. right there. Yep. And on the four wheel steers, they put the shocks on the inside. And it has two arms that come out here like this. And it does oh, I this. See. So, guys, this is for like when I'm doing like onesie stuff like this where I don't want to fire up a whole spiel. This is my little guy, right? No, I've got a 400 pounds. What size crucible is that? Number 400, 400 pounds. It's about 55 gallon drum. Whoa! It's the. But I don't have any place to. I, and I'm in the city, so I don't have any place to set a water heater outside. I don't have a place to.
rabbit that was over there? I did see a rabbit over there. There's a big one too. Yeah. I thought that was cool as shit. Like, Jeeps in January. This Jeep runs great. Yeah, it does. It just starts right up, too. Yeah, like, that's amazing to me. <laughs> I like the glasses. I, I'm a big fan of safety glasses. So what's going to happen is I'm going to pull out the crucible. I'm going to set it on here. I'm going to close my door. I'm going to take off the slag, which is the impurities from the sand and excess. Uh, it's going to come off actually as a form of molten glass. And then we're going to pour. Wow. 
That's wild. Who's your electric bill, Joe? Why is my electric bill so damn high? I feel heat already. Wow. I can too. <laughs> All right, so right now we're at about 2,050 degrees. This is the slag coming off the top here. Those are all the impurities. For the foundries like in India that don't skim that, that's why your parts look like crap. <laughs> and throwing away profits, man. That's right. All right. Wow. Oop. That's what we didn't want to happen. That's all right. Yeah. So that's what happens. Lighted exit signs, too. <laughs> Turn off the spark system. Just follow me on. What's that the first one you see? Uh, that one's a silicon carbide. They also make them out of clay graphite. I was going to ask that question, too. Like, why doesn't it melt? Yeah. Yeah. Look at the pretty fire. That's so cool. it's solid, and this brass That's your solidifies at 1750 Fahrenheit. So these there, so the dull orange, are going to be somewhere in that 1500 Fahrenheit range. Those are better, more well than those. I was going to say, no, 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 no. Those No, these are actually cotton. These are foundry gloves. Wow. We've got a whole bag of them at home that I use because you burn them up eventually. Yeah. But when I mean, you can tell, they, you can touch it long enough, you know, until you burn through like that. But you can touch that for a pretty good amount of time. So, all right. Well, we'll let this one roll, and then uh, about 10 minutes, we'll shake it out and, and start another one. So, so what's burning right now? What's, what's so, being hey, Joe, come here a minute. This is a... Uh, Petrobon sand, which is silica oh, sand. Son of a bitch. It's, uh, so it's silica, it's an organophilic clay, which is a rendered animal fat, and oil. And the reason this uses that type of clay is normal water bond sand is bentonite clay. It comes out of the ground. Oil and water don't mix, as we all from you know high school chemistry. So you have to use a special clay. So they actually take a animal fat, they render it, and then they treat it where it allows it to naturally absorb oil. The reason we're running this type of sand is it doesn't dry out and you get a, a much finer, nicer uh, surface finish. This is also infinitely reusable. So when this is done, I'll shake that out back into my bucket and I can put that sand right into another mold and make another casting immediately. How hot is it in the center of the casting right now where it's insulated? So you can generally tell by about the screw top right here. We can see this is a nice dull red. So we're probably about 16 to 1500 there and we should be a couple hundred degrees hotter in the center of the cavity. So if I were to shake this out right now, most likely there's still liquid. So the casting being relatively thin will be pretty solid. However, the feeder next to it, actually, which is this guy right here, this is still gonna be liquid. So if I pull that top off, we're just gonna get molten metal ever and then we'll have a real fire. Yeah. So yeah, if there's interest, I can do a, a shift fork. I know people had to get going. It's, it really depends if people want to ram up a loose mold. So earlier I did a, a pattern mold, right? So this is a match plate that makes the part. And this is very efficient. I have what's called a loose pattern here where you actually run this. I just need a flat board and you make this and instead of squeezing both halves, you actually make one half, remove the board, and then put the sand in without the board. It's a longer process and it's more labor intensive, but in some cases it's more cost effective. So if there's enough interest, that's still at about 1900. I can throw some more metal in, we'll have you know, 30, 40 minutes and I'll make another one. Yeah. Making the mold, right? You need to learn how to do it. So I've got a, a, a cast iron, a, a steel welded Babbitt ladle because I bought it from an old timer who used to work tons of Babbitt down in uh, Stoke, Wisconsin. Really? Yeah. He, his name was Peter Bruno. Peter, yeah. Stokes. You know Peter? Oh, okay. So these yeah, are all from the top. Yeah. So I bought a bunch of stuff. So 
I don't know much about it, but I know there's... What we're going to do here now, we're going to do what's called loose pattern mold. So I've got my part in my mold. I'm going to set it in there and I'm going to clock it in an area that allows me to get my metal in, over, and then a, a uh, riser or feeder in there. So I'm going to apply my release agent, which is parting powder. Bless you, mold. Yeah. <laughs> For the ones that get really tricky, I have a different release agent here, uh, which is basically a very, very fine aluminum powder. All right. So from there, just, I'm going to start my riddle. And the purpose of the riddle is to break up any lumps and allow very fine sand around the mold which will allow me to get better detail. So on the Jeep grill, those tiny little slots, I would never be able to pull those unless I riddled the sand. It's not fine enough. You have to break up all the lumps and get really small to get in there. Okay. metal that's probably not going to abrade the steel. It's softer material, but you can't find it. Take my sweatshirt with me. All right, so I'm just going to apply some sand in there. I'm going to shake it and I'm going to check how far I filled it. And I filled above the part, which is what I wanted. So now I'm going to compress the sand lightly. And at this point, I can add in any other sand I want of any shape. It doesn't matter because the part is covered. Now I'm just making what they call backing sand. This is a double sided. So now I'm going to take my rammer and I want to ram around the outside first, which will lock in the part so it doesn't move on me because I got to ram it hard. This sand is nice and loose, but when you squeeze it, the harder you squeeze it, the harder it forms a shape and keeps the shape. So if you don't ram it hard enough, you'll never keep your shape. That's good advice. <laughs> Just going ahead. Wow. So that's the first layer. So now we're going to top it off. You got a mechanical squeezer at home? Yeah, I got a Jolt squeeze machine. It's all pneumatic. It's got a 12 inch diameter air piston. I run it at 130 pounds. So you can get the idea how much force you're actually putting around the sand. Yep. Well, I have those too, the hand ones that are pneumatic, but I've got the big machine, which is, you know, still the way that they were doing it in the 30s and the 20s, right? The modern are all hydraulic, but again, that's, you know, like a CNC kind of deal. So now I've rammed the back. I'm going to strike it off. I forget who I was talking to. You got a little bit too much of a hole right there. So I'm going to pack some more right there and run it. And now, no one really cares about the backs of molds. Molders are always paid piece rate. You're not paid for the back, you're paid for the, the mating like sand. The problem yeah, is, yeah, especially with this area. sand, okay. if you don't have a flat enough back in an area to support it, when the metal hits, it'll burn the binder. And if there's no nothing underneath, it'll drop out and all the metal will come out the bottom of the mold. That's flat. Yeah. Which is how that belt buckle that I was showing you earlier that I just charged failed. Mm -hmm. So, from here, all I'm going to do is roll it. Now I don't have a bottom board on this one like I did on the last one because it's under that mold right there. We'll apply that board before we pour. As long as you have a flat enough surface, which this board's actually gonna work on, uh, you're fine. The key is just not to have something that's uh, not flat and you uh, you actually smash the sand out. So, you guys can see your shift fork right here. And so this is why loose pattern molding is so much more difficult. So it's cocked slightly, and because there's the little nubs that cross the parting line. So what I have to do is I have to take this, and I actually have to carve this all the way down to the parting line, all the way around. How do you know where the parting line is? You gotta memorize it before you put it in the sand. Wow. That's the number one issue people screw up on is they don't know where their parting line is and then they get tear up. So back in the day, a foundry molder was one of the most skilled jobs in the plant. It was equivalent to a, a journeyman machinist. 
and the test was they would give you a pile of sand, they'd give you a, a teacup, the saucer, and a spoon, and you had to ram that up out of sand and pour it. Draw all the gating, everything, with this and a flask and a bucket of sand. So that was the old school test. Most people these days can't do that anymore. You ever tried it? I got a lot of them at home. There's a contest in Milwaukee. I use that every year. <laughs> So what I'm doing here is I'm slowly removing the sand down to the parting line only where it needs to be removed. And luckily this pattern is very simple. It's relatively flat. If I got something that was uh, very amorphous in shape and you've got all the nooks and crannies, that's where you really get in trouble. And I'm just gonna smooth the sand in between. And I'm gonna come in like this. We'll what get happens a little bit if here. you forget your uh, if you what? If you lose track of your party line. Oh, right. Um, then you're going to get a lot of tear up or you're not going to have a mold. You'll run into a lot of issues. Yeah. All right, so here's the problem. So, I'm down to the parting line, I believe. I still have to make the top before I can pull the pattern out. So this is where if you forgot where your parting line was, and you actually didn't get down to it, you have to do the whole other half and go to pull the pattern and you get basically to the end and then you realize you screwed up and you gotta start over. So <laughs> that's the part that's by parting line. Oh, it's a great <coughs> point. Where the two halves are going. So patterns need draft. Draft is taper. So if we think of a round part, where they come together in the center, that's your parting line. If you go under that, when you go to pull this part out, the sand's gonna hook under it, and you're gonna break the sand away. Oh, okay, I get you, all right. So every part has to have a parting line, which is why you guys always see the seam. The seam is the parting line. You look at all your old Jeep parts, you'll always see those seams. All right, so we've done this. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna think ahead, and I'm actually gonna draw my gating on this part. So when I make my coat, I know exactly where to carve out, so I'm not playing the guess and check. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a feeder right here, and I'm gonna feed into this part right here. So that's where my metal's gonna go. That's gonna come back to my runner, which is gonna come over like that, and I'm gonna put my sprue right there. Pretty simple. I'm gonna give it a little bit of draft so it's easy to see. All right. Now, I'm gonna put my cope on, and these pins do matter. One is tight within a thou, the other one is slotted. So it's tight within a thou in one direction, but slotted on the other. It's a king and a queen. One yeah, beats, yeah. the other follows. Oh. All right, so now I apply my parting powder, and this will prevent my halves from sticking together. If you don't put this on, you ram all your sand, mold's not going to work. It's going to tear off and you're going to have a terrible mold. you got to make it again. All right, back to my riddle. And I'm going to cheat a little bit here. And I'm actually going to put my sprue in now so I don't lose it. we got a little bit of cracking, which happens, but we'll uh, adjust accordingly. When you lose pattern mold, there's actually a separate sprue called the sprue cutter that you use. And instead of being a solid body, it's a uh, cylinder that's hollow in the middle and you actually just tap it in. We'll see if this works. If not, we'll uh, adjust accordingly. All right. So, you want to just hold that while you pour? <coughs> actually, yeah, you just want to pour some sand in for me. Ooh, okay. you, want that, you want to hold this? Yeah. Yeah. All right, just go ahead and pour a bunch in on top. A little more, a little more. Perfect, you're good. That's all you need. Yep, that's it. So because this side doesn't have a lot of detail, you can set that bucket down. We're done with the with the sand. So now I'm gonna go in, I'm gonna squish it all back. It's good work, man. Yeah, good <laughs> fighter, good job. Yeah. And now I'm just gonna top it off to the top and we're gonna ram again. Participation. Yeah. Does the parting line always have to be halfway through the thickness? Um, it always has to be, so like this one, how it's tipped down, you'll see my parting line will tip, so my cope will have a hanger. Okay. So it will hang off. Uh, 
where you run into problems is if you have too deep of a parting line, you're gonna run into issues where when you go to pull that, if you have too much of a hanger, it'll just break because the yeah. sand doesn't yeah. have the tensile strength. Where we're gonna run into a questionable issue here is this sand, because it's softer, the, the, the mix that I have here for today was for you know a finer mix to pull that grill. When I ram this, if I over ram, it's actually gonna sink into the bottom and the bottom's gonna break out and off the ream do the whole thing. Which isn't the end of the world, won't be the first time I had to remake the mold. Won't be the last. So if you, if you ram too soft, it doesn't stick together. If you ram too hard, you break it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> So there's a lot of uh, experience on how to handle these things. Yeah, and so the, the easy method that a lot of people go to now, which isn't as cost effective, is called chem bond, which is yeah, chemically bonded sand. Sand. It's sand and glue. You mix it up in a cement mixer or a KitchenAid or a continuous mixer, and when you ram it, you just literally pour it in, you pack it, you let it set up, and you pull it apart. Well, the problem is you can't reuse it. This sand, you'll see, I mean, I can just scoop all this up and just remold again. Sure. So, so this takes more skill. Years to work with. Really yes, amazing. and so I use Kembon for cores, My son, which is where you need it because this sand doesn't have the strength to make the core. He, he That's the problem. Everywhere around on the city, look like the definition of experience. There's no substitute for kind of like. Just to find a long time because for me it's like four minutes. Still mentioned it. I was like, getting down, right? I guess. Doesn't hurt so bad. It's when I try to come back. So again, I'm going to make that pouring well. Yeah. A little depth, a little funnel, if you will, for me to hit with the metal. And I know I'm betting that I made that drag good enough. We're about to find out. Don't take a breath before you do it. You got to breathe through the exercise. Clear my pins off so I don't get sand binding it off. Because anyone knows, if you get sand in there, it's never going to pull straight. You have to pull straight, or it's going to tear up. I miss Amy. Good. Got a little bit of cracking from that ramming, which is what I talked about. But if we look at this side now, we can see those tracks I traced in there. I have to carve all that out by hand still. On the mounted tool, it's already there. I don't have to do anything. I just blow it out, put it back together. In this case, I still have to do all this hand carving, which again, back to the whole skill thing, right? And time in, time out. So I'm going to leave that there and just hope it doesn't fall over on me. I'm gonna come over to this half. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna carve out my runner. And I'm gonna go, for simplicity today, we're gonna go about a half inch down, and this is right around one inch wide. Half by one. And the key here is the choke section should be my sprue. I want the smallest cross-sectional area at the sprue. So that's my runner. So the metal comes down the sprue to the runner. From there, it's going to go over to the feeder, which is going to have the in gate in it. Now, this part's all in the drag. The drag is the bottom, the cope is the top. So I have two options. I can do what's called a lap gate. <coughs> a lap gate is when I take the metal and I come over the top, and then I have to grind that gate away. I can also do a side gate. You, the side gate is much easier because I come in with a bandsaw and just cut it. You have to determine, based on the geometry of the part and the machining, what makes more sense. Normally I like to put them where I'm going to machine away, so you never even see the gate at all. In this case, I would normally, when I mount this as a pattern at home, it'll always come in the side. I'll make it in the drag like this upside down, it'll always come in the side. That gives me the best feeding, so I know I don't have any porosity in the center, so when I drill that, it's all solid metal. For today, for simplicity, we're going to lap gate it. We're going to go right over the top. And the reason I'm going to do that is if we have another run out like that, I know I will get a casting because all the metal will come over the top and in, it'll be completely full. It might not be a uh, porosity free <coughs> solid casting, but you'll get the entire shape. So with that being said, I'm done with this side with the exception of pulling the pattern. At home I use compressed air. Don't we have that here. I have that right here. He yeah. does, but <laughs> I don't want to. When you use compressed air, it's going to blow it all the way into Bob and beyond. That would right? suck. Yeah. That's so bad. get your camera lens dirty. Yeah. Yeah. 
So did now it for the, you. the part you guys remember the game Operation. Yep. This yeah. is the part where you have to get that out as clean as possible without breaking it. So it has to come out nice and straight, which is why you need that taper to release. So as you pull up, it releases from the sand. So we have a little bit of tear up from the cracking, but it's all in nice, easy to grind spots, so we're gonna be okay. And this is where you kind of make that decision of, hey, did I crack too much, start over, or are we still good? So we've got a little bit right here on the inside of the fork, on this ear. Well, I'm gonna machine that, so I don't care. I'm gonna come in there with a carbide cutter, it's not gonna matter. I've got a little bit on the back right here, well, that's really easy for me just to roll on my, my two inch belt sander, it'll come right off. Now, if I were to have some in this corner, Maybe I have to go in there with an end mill. That one might be a question, right? If it's up in here, where it's really hard to get to, at that point, I'm probably just gonna scrap the mold. So that's where knowing what the end use or of the part like matters. Some weird radius where yeah. Somewhere where it's not easy to remove. That's the big key. So this this is the part you get from India then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They don't scrap anything. No. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that crap yeah. off the top of there? That's what they make the rubber parts from. There we go. So that's crap. done. Okay, so that side's good. So now, what I'm gonna do is on this side, I'm gonna carefully pull this screw out without taking all the sand with it. I'm gonna flatten that well out right there. This has already been drawn in the drag. So I don't need to redraw that. That's why I did those lines so you can see where it is. So I'm gonna come over to this side. I'm gonna try to do this upside down, guys, so bear with me, I'm not very coordinated. Uh, so right here, I'm gonna put my feeder. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start coming in and I wanna make a mass big enough that it will be hotter, longer than the thickest section of this casting so that I always keep positive metal in. Castings shrink two ways. They shrink solid to solid and liquid to solid. Solid to solid shrink is where we have issues. Liquid to solid is where you have to make the pattern bigger than the part because the part dimensionally changes. That's where you get your, uh, if somebody says, hey, here's my shift fork, just use that to make the pattern. I just saw you do loose pattern molding, just use my shift fork. Well, when it goes from uh, liquid to solid in there, it will naturally contract. Brass shrinks about eight thousandths per inch up to 17 thousandths per inch based on alloy. Aluminum is somewhere between the 10 and 15 range. Again, it's alloy and geometry specific. If I had a giant uh, transfer case cover where it's got that big hump in the middle, that sand's gonna prevent it from shrinking because it's hard sand. But if I have a really flat part, just like a bar, there's nothing to hold it up to prevent it from shrinking, so it's just gonna pull itself in. So, I'm gonna put my lap gate in right now. So I'm gonna come halfway over and I'm gonna dig in there. All right, so now I'm going to lift my mold over here. I'm going to go horizontal. We're going to come straight down. And we're going to close the mold. That mold is done. All right, nice work. And that's uh, green sand molding. Now, for those of you that asked if you guys want me to get into the cores, everyone's always like, okay, well, I saw you make something here, right? I saw you make something solid. What if it's an engine block and I've got all these water jacket passages to it or a cylinder head? How do you do that? That's where I use the air set sand at home. So when you have a undercut and you can't get the sand in there, so again, we'll use the riddle. If I was gonna make this as a pipe and I have to get this giant cavity on the inside and I'm not gonna make it like this, and I'm gonna make it like this, my green sand mold and my flask is gonna go to the top and the bottom. But if I pour that, I'm gonna get a solid cylinder of aluminum. I want a hollow cylinder with just a, a wall, right? A pipe. So I need to put a sand core in the center that runs across. This green sand isn't strong enough to make a core. So you make a core box, which is the opposite of the pattern. It's the negative, so you can blow a positive into it. And you mix sand and glue together. So it's silica sand, and there are a lot of different binder systems. I like phenolic esters and sodium silicates. 
For those of you who don't know, sodium silicate is what Taco Bell uses to thicken their meat. It's also a sand binder <laughs> for Yummy. Boundaries. So, Yummy. it's also what <laughs> they now start putting in, in the stop leak for your cylinder heads. They say run it really hot and it'll stop. <laughs> like it absolutely the destroys the your water. Like okay. But that's what it is. It's water glass. It's a two-part binder. It mixes together. When it hits heat, it fires. And it's stable up to about 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. So, you'll mix up the sand and the glue. You'll pack the form. You'll let it stay until it hardens. You remove the form. And now I've got a sand log that I would have put in that mold before I closed it. So, maybe if we do another demo at some point, I'll bring a core pattern and show everyone how a core works. But, that's it for now. Uh, well, I, uh, I honestly have a Okay, nobody sneezed. <laughs> no, you can't, it can fall. Yeah, the metal's in there. Yep. Can anything really go wrong at this point? No. A little bit, but not a whole lot. This is just to try to keep it off Joe's floor. At home, I got a big tank, and I just go bang, 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 and it just drops right out. There we go. That's cool. All right. So we have one half of the flask out. Oh, now we're going to get a casting. And look at that. Looks like we got a belt buckle. Wow, that's cool. Looks like it's pretty good. This is probably about three So how much material here actually ended up in the buckle versus waste? Not wasted, but excess. No, no, no great, great question. The gating, so it's yield, right? How efficient was I? Which is why I run a six on at home, because regardless, I always have to fill up this big bar, and also because you need enough distance, so if there's any impurities, which you can actually see in this one, you see all these little pits on top? That's all slag and things. So if you run along and afar, which is actually why I have this little trap right here, you'll get that to settle out before it gets into your part which is what I want. I don't want that in my part. If I wanted to do a, a really crappy, I'd just go right from the sprue to the part and be done, but i get all these impurities in my part and it would look like garbage. So when I do six on, I have the same length there, and I go a few more, but it gets a lot higher yield, yeah, more efficient. Yeah, but run into six gates. Yeah, but it gets way more efficient. So I run one off of each side of the feeder. So in this one, this is about three and a half pounds of total pour weight for about a half pound to 0.4 pound part. So the yield is garbage on this. I'd go out of business if I was doing this professionally. You get fired, right. yeah. So yeah. That stuff over off of your uh, right hand side, that was yep. all the flash that blew out? Yep, this is the flash that blew out. So normally it would have ended right here. So I will saw this part right here, and the rest of this gets remelted as my returns. And then just a little bit of grinding, and away she goes. Yeah. Is, is there a, a maximum time you can remelt the new? due to like loss of the heat? So um, what you'll do is you'll actually, you'll lose alloy. So in this, I'll burn off zinc and tin. In my aluminum, I run uh, 356 aluminum, which is what we use on airplanes. It's aluminum, magnesium, silicon is the main elements. The mag burns off. So I always have to keep throwing magnesium back into my pots to keep it in spec. If I run out of mag, I won't get uh, the proper microstructure. I'll get. I'll lose all my strength. So, so you have to like test your metal every so often. Then? Yeah. So you either you have two options. Either one. Well, you got like three options, right? One is you don't care, which is what most like art foundries do. They just keep melting and melting it. Then they go, well, why does it not pour as well, right? Because when you lose your elements, sometimes you lose fluidity and it won't pour with it. it. You know, it pours like sludge. And you're like, I got to keep going hotter and hotter and hotter to make the same casting. What's going on? Um, you can test it or the solution to pollution is dilution. I, when I run my main melt, I always add virgin brand new ingot back in with my returns, so I never melt pure returns. So here for today, all of this was ingot last week, so it's all brand new, it's one-time burn metal, so I know I didn't alloy enough of it off. 
So I made sure I had that. If I was running this, you know, where it churns a lot, like my other returns, I always add in some prime back into it. And then occasionally I pull a spectro sample and I go and I get it shot and check to see what the chemistry is. And then I do a big mass melt and add it in. Or I need to pour heavy enough parts that so much metal's going out the door that I'm constantly having to add new in and, the, and it doesn't get old enough. So this being a light part and the shift fork being a relatively heavy part, I'm gonna run three on shift forks. I will burn enough metal off when I do that that I'm gonna have to add in at a rate fast enough that the chemistry will always be spec. If I do a lot of belt buckles, I'm gonna have to add in or I'm gonna have to worry about my chemistry and I'm gonna not be able to use enough returns. So. Now, this being brass, it's yep. stayed size on size. It's so yeah. returning. <laughs> yeah. It's so sticky too. All right. The old brass on weight first and then uh, the one burning. Transfer that onto this aluminum bottom board. And then, uh, rock and roll. That's why I went to dig through my hamper. I'm like, all right, where's my foundry clothes? I'm not wearing my good stuff. <laughs> all right. Better, why don't you grab Emmy? It's a Saturday go to milk. So for anyone interested, she's like, no. Whole, she's a little handle on top. You're gonna want personal protective equipment. You're gonna want a good set of spats that are easy to tear off. So if you get metal behind them, you can get them off right away, get the metal away. And the other thing is, you need kickoff boots. And the reason for that is I have gotten metal in my shoe before There's at an industrial yeah. point. The faster you get the boot off, the faster it's away from your skin. I've had well, well, you do get a lot of sand well, and dirt there, but well, you guys yeah. were there, right? <laughs> it, it is, man. I mean, the last time I went down the back of this boot, I had a scar for two and a half years. Yeah. Aluminum is the worst metal to pour from a standpoint of danger. It's lower temperature, but it's actually, it wets to your skin and sticks. Iron and brass are dense enough that the sweat in your skin beads them and they roll off. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Milk right So you're saying they stick to Jonah's skin then? Yeah. Good. That's right. Yeah. Good. Iron good. I'm right. saying that's ready. No, not sweaty. <laughs> yeah, so it's the yeah, opposite. I'm sweaty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be sweaty. Right? I don't want to be the sweaty guy. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, you feel like I was <laughs> right there. Yeah. Isn't that something? Well, yeah, that's hey, pretty. Cool. Two thousand degrees, man. So pretty though. There's the shit you sell to India. That's right. <laughs> Make Jeep parts out of it. Jewelry. Yeah. Jeep parts. Mm -hmm. like, so normally I have a little fiber uh, or ceramic skimmer that I run in these, but you know, it's one more thing I gotta worry about lighting something on fire in Joe's shop. I appreciate your consideration. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So that's all the metal that I had, or I got a little bit left in there. So normally I would have an ingot mold. I'm gonna figure out where I'm gonna put that and get rid of it real quick. So you don't want it to go into the crucible because you'll never get it out again. And the problem is then you can't test your crucible to see if it's still good. So you melt it, if your crucible has a crack, it won't ring. You go to melt and then you get you open the furnace door and liquid comes out and hits you there. Ah. So you just have to make a quick mold of something? Yeah, so I'm just gonna do a, a just an open mold real quick. Mm -hmm. And uh All right. Where, where do we want to start? I mean, if, we're, if you're starting, uh, I'd say give me your name and what we're looking at. Where are we going to put this? Uh, I don't know, probably going to Jeepster Man. Okay. Um, so my name is Lindsey Clark, um, and I repair and restore some GPs. I've probably owned 15 in my life. Um, if you're a Jeep person, you you know that this is a, a Jeep, but it's very different from some of the CJ2As, the MB. Uh, there's not a lot that's different. These were built by Ford. They were test vehicles for the government. Um, they, 
government ordered the first 1,500 of them was uh, the first test, and they were built in the early part of 1941. This one happens to be a Series 2 and has some different things in the Series 1. Um, but Ford built these, and Ford built them with a lot of shelf parts, and they were um, a lot of parts that they had on hand. Uh, for example, here you've got some Model A style shocks that go on this. Um, they were good about riveting frames. These were riveted frames that would flex. Um, if you go to the engine, the engine is a, basically a 9 in tractor engine. Um, if you look at the way it's set in there, it's a long stretch. And when they would jump them, it would break that front engine support. That was a common thing for them to part for them to fail. Huh. Um, but one of the things that the government wanted was they wanted it to go in, in water, not underwater, but be able to go through water without stalling out. So they built a distributor on the front of the engine so that the, the distributor was on top. Uh, a 9 in tractor engine was a um, uh, had an updraft carburetor, so they had to they, to go through water. They had to have a downdraft carburetor. And they built this carburetor especially for this vehicle, which made them very rare for a long time until they've been reproduced. Uh, if you had a GP, and this one does have an original carburetor on it, which uh, is a rare. Kind of a rare thing, but um, oh, Ford invented this where the headlights push up. You got to undo it. We'll have to lower it, but flip them over, and, and you can shine the light onto the uh, engine if you're if you're working on it. Supposedly was a Ford idea when Willie started building the CJ2A. Uh, they they didn't do that because they were afraid that was a Ford design is what I my understanding. It makes sense though. Uh, I'm no expert. Series 2, this one has the later lights in it, the blackout lights. Um, the headlights are hard to get because they, to my knowledge, that's the only thing that these headlights buckets went in. Um, they did build the first 1500 was Series 1, Series 2 was 2000 some. They used the solid disc wheels that were used on all the prototypes. They're 4 inches wide, uh, or should be 4 inches wide. The early CJs used a 4.5 wide. Um, the steering column was a Ford shelf part, and I've been told it's an English Anglia is where it was derived from. Um, they did build 50 of these in a four-wheel steer version um, and build a special steering box that goes back by the frame and had another tie rod that came back and drove, drove the rear axle that way. It was a very interesting setup with a, uh, a gear in it that, that was, had a delay so you didn't have, you could turn the wheel and still be going straight and you turn the wheel 15 minutes and then the four-wheel steer would engage. Yeah, I didn't know that. Um, it's got a Model A transmission mated to that. It's a 9-in tractor engine, but they tried to boost the the uh, boost the, the compression, so it's got a, a head that's got a little higher compression head, a little more piston in it, um, and a camshaft with a little more duration in it. They're all stamped GP. They built this skid plate for the, and the tractor engine had a cast oil pan, but that oil pan is stamped and, and is for the GP. It's got a cut, they had to make a cutout in it so that the drive shaft would, would go through. Um, and the, the, the drive line on these, the drive shafts are on the left side, whereas Willie's were all on the right side. I can't remember where the Bantam's on the left side. Bantam might be on the left side. Um, more shelf parts that were used up here. The gauge is a Ford, Ford truck gauge package. Um, steering wheel was 36 Ford standard. I mean, some of these parts will be 
like toolbox locks were like for mercury 41 mercury glove box locks um, what else um, so it was stamped it wasn't stamped F it was stamped GP like actual GP on which on any like most of the parts on this the only place that it's stamped is on the back that is forward and interestingly enough I have serial number one or the first one off the assembly line let me say that because there was serial number one mm -hmm. but the first one off the assembly line is not stamped forward nowhere on that vehicle does it say it was built by Ford <laughs> and it also had early holes in the in the rear bumper bumper rats they were larger holes for some reason um, should have grab handles on the back should have reflectors here later ones had the, the series 2 had a, had the very similar tail lights to the MBs the early the first series had a, a di different tail light it was first um, what else some of the differences in series one and series two series one has two hood hood blocks that hold the hood and the hood hood bumps up against the windshield that's a dead giveaway whether they're series one or series two um, the seats have ribs in the back of them in a series two um, there are some changes throughout. I can't remember all the little changes, but uh, they're, they're interesting vehicles. And they're hard to find parts for. You guys will buy them and think they. You're just not going to call a Jeep dealer and say, "Hey, I want the part. I need some parts for a GP." Uh, you're going to have to find something that somebody's manufactured or an old Ford part. These are these are 41 Ford truck. Uh, oh, okay. So how many of these were produced? 1500 Series 1 and 22 and 300 of the Series 2. Okay. And this is one of the second series. And they ran what, 40, 40 to 41? 40, well, early early 41 to later in 41. They started them in the first, oh, January, late January. and. And uh, I think they built them as late as October of 41. They were even building slack grills. Willie's was building slack grills at the at a similar time at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It's an awesome looking Jeep. You yeah. take it home, huh? Yes, it's, it's nice. It's it's not rusty. It's uh, nice straight. Yeah, it, it's one of the nicer ones I've ever bought. Mm -hmm. Or GP. Well, it hasn't been in three years. And the part just fell through. Yep, it's because of the weight and the burn yeah. on the sand. Yeah, the sand can't hold it. And that's what I was talking about. If I didn't have that board under there, we would have burned it out, right? Because of the weight. Yep. So I take my flasks. And those won't go together backwards? Um, they can, it doesn't matter. The pins are identical on these, yeah, it's, it's the slots. The yeah. I have some at home that aren't identical, and it's a hex pin and a round pin. Okay, so you can't fuck it up. Yep. And would you look at that, there's a cast. Oh, it looks good though. Yep. So we had that tear up we talked about right there, a little bit there, and a little bit on the inside, which is that machine surface. And we saw all that and we talked about it. So this is perfectly fine, and uh, that'll be easily machined out. All of this will be a quick zip on the belt sander because on the outside, the inside is where the hard paint hit to hit with the belt sander. This all I quick zip on my sander. That's 30 seconds. Take that off. Take this off, and then it's onto the bridge port and start doing the machining. Yep. Then a, a three or four step machine process after that, depending on how we flip the pad. Yeah. Yeah. Depending on how we do it, I gotta figure out like I said, if I want to do it on the lathe, if I want to do it on the mill. I can do it both ways. The interesting thing is the original, the, they're actually flats. They're not round on the inside of the pads. They're flats. So I could just come with an end mill and go cut over cut like a rectangle because they are flats. Well, or, that's why we want to figure out how much. Should we go over? Should we not? Go over? Yeah, and that's the original how much slop. Well, the original had shit pots of slop on it. But it's a question of, hey, do we want it sloppy so when the guys assemble it, it's easy? Or do we want it tight so you don't get that rattle? And it really comes to debate, right? So 
Good job, man. Yeah, no worries. I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. Like I said, I pitched it last year, and there was some, someone was like, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, maybe, you know, and I was like, well, I'll do it and see what happens. And uh, it seemed to have gotten a, a good crowd appeal, at least. Yeah. Oh. Very informative. <laughs> yeah, well, you can ask me all the questions. I'll tell you the, I'll tell you the answers. <laughs> awesome. Actually, you know what? No, no, no high tech at all.